so glad that uh, all of you young scientists are joining us again. We're on episode two, so thank you very, very much. We got uh, several people contacting us from last our first episode last Wednesday, sending us some photos of taking the temperature of your lawn and some of the things we are doing. So Ms. Rachel and I really, really appreciate you sending some photos in and contacting us. And you are welcome to do that this week too. Uh, you can send photos of what you're doing in your lawn. You can send um, some questions to Miss Rachel, and we will be glad to answer those. So this is episode two. Uh, we are going to get started here. And you know, we're joined by a friend of Miss Rachel and I called Mr. Grass Guy. I call him Mr. Grass Guy. And that's that little grass character right there. And he wants to know if everybody was is having fun on their lawn, like we talked about last week. Did you play football with your dad? Did you play pitch and catch with your mom? Maybe you played the grand prize game. So I hope you're having fun. Uh, we hope you're uh, enjoying your lawn and getting out while we're all social distancing and we're staying at home. There's a lot of fun things we can all do on our lawn. So. Mr. Grass Guy wants to know if uh, you had fun last week. And if you did, uh, you might send a little note to Miss Rachel. Last week, remember, we talked about the first lawn in the United States, and that was our third president, Thomas Jefferson, at his home in Monticello, Virginia. He had the first lawn. That was right around uh, about 1810, 1808 to 1810. That was a long time ago. Well, this week, we, we're going to talk about if people are starting to plant lawns, they need a lawnmower to mow their lawn, don't they? So we're going to talk about the first lawnmower. The first lawnmower, here's a picture of the first lawnmower. This has been restored, and it's in a museum. Look at that mower. Does that look like a mower you would use at home or your mom and dad use? The story behind this is really interesting. It was over in England and a British engineer named Edwin Bunny worked in textile mills. You know what a textile mill is? It's a big factory where they made carpet for homes. And as the workers were, were putting strands of carpet uh, into making a big giant carpet, Edwin Bunny noticed that the strands of carpet were different lengths. So he invented a machine that would go across the carpet and cut those little strands of carpet to the same length so the carpet was nice and smooth and nice and even. After a few years, Mr. Budding, the engineer that he was, began asking an I wonder question. He wondered if his carpet sharing machine would cut grass on lawns that people were planting over in England. So he got the help of some friends and some engineers and came up with a machine. And after a lot of research and trial and error, they came up with the first lawnmower. And it actually worked. They went from a machine that cut strands of carpet to the same length to a machine that cut grass the same length. And that's what the first lawnmower looked like. Isn't that interesting? It's got a roller. It's got these big cast iron wheels and a big handle. What's really interesting, you see the red blades in the front of the mower? Those are called real blades, R-E-E-L. They're real style blades. And they, as you turn the wheels, those gears turn the real blades to cut grass nice and even. And what's really interesting, this invention was so good that those same basic real blades are used today, not so much on home lawns, but they're used a lot on golf courses and sports fields. That is just fascinating. And it all started with an engineer in England who asked, and I wonder question, I wonder if this carpet machine would actually cut grass, and he invented the first lawnmower. Mr. Grass Guy is asking, do you think this would be hard to push? That mower was really heavy, and it was really hard to push. So newer mowers came along, 
And here's an example of one of those mowers. I found this advertisement. This is like about 60 to 70 years later in the late 1800s. You can see the mower there. It still has these big cast iron wheels and has a real blade on the front of it. This was from the Charter Oak Mowing Company. What's interesting about this ad, the people at the lawnmower company wanted to have people buy these mowers, so they put these two young women with their Sunday best uh, clothes on, probably to show people how easy this mower is to push and how easy it would be to use. And it certainly is a lot smaller than the first one. But Mr. Grass guy is thinking, using his science and his engineering skills, I think this is still going to be pretty hard to push. Do you think it's going to be hard to push? Mr. Grass guy does. But that's how mowers changed over time. They got smaller, lighter, and they were easier to, to use. <clears throat> the next slide is Mr. Grass guy's favorite mower. It is one of the most modern mowers around. Mr. Grass guy says, <clears throat> I really like this lawnmower. Have you ever seen a mower like this? <clears throat> this is a mower that's like a drone. It's like a robot. And this mower will just, it doesn't have a handle. It doesn't have a steering wheel. It's run by what we call GPS. That's what your mom and dad use for directions as they drive around town. And this mower will actually mow your, go back and forth and mow your lawn for you. And this is one of the most modern mowers around. So look at where we came from. The first mower about 160, 70 years ago with those big cast iron wheels that were hard to push to a modern day mower that runs by itself. That's what innovation is. And that's what scientists and engineers do. And that's why we talked about STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math last week. So that's what young turf grass scientists can do and help people with their lawns. And Mr. Grass Guy really likes this, this uh, robotic GPS mower. Another modern invention, because inventions take place all the time, don't they? A lot of products are made from oil. Everything from soccer balls to Legos and everything in between. There was a scientist up in Canada that asked an I wonder question also. And he took a product that is made from oil that's highly refined and mothers and fathers have used on their babies for a hundred years called Johnson's baby oil. And he asked an I wonder question. And he asked, I wonder what would happen if we sprayed this baby oil on our grass plants? And he took several years and trial and error, and he had people that were helping him. And his name was Dr. Michael Fieber. He was a chemist. And this was back in the early 1990s. And after 20, 25 years, he came up with this product that we sell, and we sell at the golf courses around the world. And it's an organic product. It keeps plants healthy. It keeps them from getting diseases. It even helps plants use less water. And it all started with a scientist who said, I wonder, I wonder what would happen. That's what scientists do. They like to ask questions. Do you like to ask questions? You know, some of you know that, or maybe you've heard in school about the scientific method. You know, the very first step in the scientific method is asking a question that starts with, I wonder. That's what a lot of scientists like to do. Here's an example of a question like that. I wonder why the grass growing in my lawn is green. Do you ever wonder that? I wonder why it's not red or blue or purple. Why is grass green? See, that's a good question that a scientist would ask. Mr. Grass Guy wants you and me to be asking those kind of questions. I ask those questions. This is a picture of me. I like to think. I like to think about I wonder questions. Mr. Grass Guy says, Mr. Bruce likes to think a lot, doesn't he? See, I think best with my hat, and I think best when I'm drinking coffee. My hat, I call my thinking cap. I think, I think better with my hat, and I think better when I drink coffee. 
And sometimes I think in my lawn, like I'm doing right now. Sometimes I'll think on my front porch. Sometimes I'll think inside my home. But the point is scientists like to think, and they like to ask questions that start with, I wonder. So Mr. Grass Guy wants you to be thinking of questions and I wonder questions. And where do you think best at? Maybe you think best in your bedroom, or maybe you think best in the kitchen, or maybe you think best riding your bike. So wherever you think best, that's what Mr. Grass Guy wants you to do as a young scientist. And by the way, make sure you check with your mom and dad before you think about drinking coffee. They might have rules about that. So check with your mom and dad first. Maybe you want to drink with apple juice or your favorite drink. But this is what Mr. Bruce likes to do. He likes to think a lot. So a couple of things. Uh, one thing we want to talk about, I was walking around our neighborhood and um, I saw a couple of these shrubs. One on the left is called a lilac shrub. They get those beautiful lilac blue flowers on them. And boy, in the uh, springtime, they smell, oh, those smell good. Those, the lilac flowers haven't bloomed yet. You see those flower buds, how tight those flower buds are? They're gonna bloom in two or three weeks. The shrub on the left, that yellow shrub is called a forsythia shrub. And that shrub was right across my, from my house. And that is blooming right now. Turfgrass scientists use plants to indicate or help identify when some event will take place, like when a weed will show up in our lawns or when an insect or a disease will show up. They're called indicator plants and the forsythia plant on the right is a really good example of that. The forsythia shrub, uh, when it's in bloom, indicates when crabgrass seeds will germinate. So scientists will use the blooming of a forsythia to know when to put down a crabgrass preventer on your lawn to keep crabgrass out. That is a great example of what an indicator plant is. Forsythia blooms predict and, and uh, tell us when the crabgrass seeds will germinate. Uh, Scientists call these crabgrass preventers pre-emergence because you put those down before the weed seeds can be seen above the ground. Now, I know some of you are younger scientists and some of you are like middle school or a little older scientists. Some of you that uh, maybe are a little older and want some advanced uh, information about this, Mr. Grass Guy says, the reason a forsythia bloom and a crabgrass plant indicates each other is because it takes about the same number of growing degree days. Have you heard of growing degree days? I bet some of you have. It takes for both of those events to occur, the blooms of the flowers and the crabgrass germination, it takes about 150 growing degree days. But that's gonna be for some of the advanced young scientists and um, that's something that you might want to know called growing degree days. And that's really interesting because scientists can, can use these indicator plants and there's all kinds of them out there. They can use indicator plants to tell us when we should do something with our lawns or they give us insight or information about what's going on in the world around us. And that's what an indicator plant is. Last week we talked about soil temperature and I told you, and by the way, we had some uh, young scientists up in Minnesota send some pictures to Miss Rachel and I on uh, what the temperature of their soil was. So I wanna thank both of you for sending that, that picture to us. So Mr. Grass Guy is saying, your soil temperature needs to be consistent. I took the temperature uh, this morning out in my lawn and you see the temperature there is above 60, uh, not quite 70, it's about 66 degrees. And that's a lot warmer than last week. Last week was only 48. So the temperature's getting warmer because the weather's warming up. 
Just remember before, and we're using our temperature, you know, our soil temperature to know when we should put seed down on our lawn. Just remember the temperature in your soil needs to be consistent in that 60 to 65 degree range for 10 to 14 days. So Mr. Grass Guy and I just looked at our, our weather app on our smartphone and the temperature where I live in Northern Indiana is supposed to drop down to about 28 degrees Friday and Saturday. So it's gonna get cold again. So now it's still gonna be a little too early. We wanna have that soil temperature very, very consistent uh, for about 10 days to 14 days before we put our seed out. I suspect we're gonna be two or three weeks out uh, before we can seed. Um, but I'm going to keep uh, going out with Mr. Grass Guy and making sure I check my soil temperature to make sure I get the right, uh, we're at the right temperature to see. So that's what we talked about on our lesson today. Uh, we've talked about the first lawnmower. We've talked about being a young scientist and asking I wonder questions. Uh, we talked about indicator plants and we reviewed soil temperature. Next week's lesson is going to be all about soil. What does a soil scientist do? And we're going to look at uh, soil and, and, you know, what different types of soil there are to grow good, healthy grass. So with that, I'm going to turn this back to Miss Rachel. And uh, Miss Rachel, Mr. Grass Guy, and I want to thank all of you for joining us. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, we will be posting this again like the last one on YouTube. And if you have any questions or concerns, please reach out to myself or to Bruce. Y'all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.